Hey, today I'm joined by Andrew Burkett of Aetherus Games. And Andrew's a writer, he's a game designer, and a game publisher. And today we're going to be talking about how to make a great theme for your game. And Andrew, you have some of the most creative themes I've seen in a while. So do you want to kind of talk to us about the themes that you've made for your, your games you've kickstarted? Yep. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I've made three, three games currently that I've uh, funded on Kickstarter. So the first game I designed, and uh, it started out as a war game. And it, it wasn't actually the first game that I designed and wanted to publish. I had another game, a totally different story, but uh, I spent a bunch of money on artwork. I uh, realized it, I couldn't finish it. I, didn't, the, I couldn't the afford it. classic game that. designer mistake. I've yeah. done it. <laughs> And so I, I was like, oh, no. And then I told my business partners at the time, I'm like, let's make another game. This, and they're like, we're, we're like halfway through this one. I'm like, no, we're, we're done with that. <laughs> <laughs> that what, what, that's the past. What was the primary reason of changing it, you said? Or, or uh, stopping? It, it, was, it was just too expensive. The artwork that and the art direction we went, it was just too expensive. Uh, we're going it, it, um, so the game company name is based on um, the first card in the first game and it was an automotive racing game and so we had custom cars designed for the game which were we I wanted them to not be like silly little illustrations I wanted them to be like hyper realistic like cool. it could be a real car and so that is very very expensive um, and so I like did like half the project and I was like, I, what's I very expensive, like $400 a, an image, a hundred dollars an image. It, it was 300 an image was pretty typical for the car artwork. And then all the other artwork was way cheaper. Uh -huh. Um, but the aggregate of like, we, I wanted a ton of cars. And so it was just, it was going to be too much. Um, so I had put a few thousand dollars into artwork and I was like, eh, nope. Let's not do this. My business partner thought I was crazy because we had been working on it forever. I was like, well, I, I just like when I had game design ideas for this game and they didn't work for it, I came up with this, these ideas and I put them in this document and I think it would make a really cool war game. And so I was going to be a war game. And then like a week later, I made a story about annoying neighbors. And I was like, <laughs> guys, remember that, that I said I was – Moving from the original game, we're going to do a war game. Well, now it's actually a war on neighbors, and so you're annoying your neighbors out of the neighborhood. And they <laughs> thought it was hilarious. And I posted it in one of the Facebook groups. I was like, "Would you buy this game with this theme?" And people were like, "Yes, that sounds hilarious." And I was like, <laughs> it does Perfect. sound funny. Uh, and so I, I, I made it like Yu-Gi-Oh cards with sticky notes on them. And made the game and prototyped it in a few days. Um, and it, it was like. My business partners at the time and I played it, and we were like, "This kind of works." Like it, it wasn't, you know, exactly right at that point, but we we're like, uh, "This is actually kind of closer than we thought it would be. It's not horrible." Um, and then so we we kept playing it, and eventually we went to Dragon Con and we we played it with people while it was still on sticky notes, and they like really liked the game. And I was like, "Wow, if we put artwork, then they're definitely gonna like this." That's awesome. so we got this crazy artwork um the artist alan Orr is super talented and then we had um we were very very fortunate that we were in um, this art and graphic design group for facebook uh -huh. and we found uh, a graphic designer that had worked on the automotive game and so we were like well we'll keep working with him on this and obviously the other artists we had worked on for the car game they designed automotive stuff so they weren't like the the best artists for this other game so we found alan on behance which is like adobe's website for creatives ah. um and then we launched on kickstarter and we raised over twenty thousand dollars and i was like wow this is great um what was and the name of this one just real quick coldest at conquest okay yeah. <laughs> I, so I saw the picture of it and I, I was wondering what the theme was now now i can put a picture to the yeah theme. that's cool yeah, it's uh, a game about annoying neighbors. So your goal is to annoy everyone out of the neighborhood. It's like a last one <laughs> in the game. And you use annoyance as you try to relax yourself. You can upgrade your house to like temporarily relieve yourself of some what's of your a, stress. What's an annoyance that you can use in the game? Um, so they vary. So there's a not safe for work expansion that they they get more risque. Um, but like the base level ones would be like you know a noisy dog barking, you know, fire, lawn. Lawn. yeah, th things like that. <laughs> Typical neighborhood annoyances. Um, 
and so we did that one and we raised money and we ran into like every mistake and you know problem imaginable we we had like the worst shipping nightmare in a hundred years apparently hanjin which was a large shipping vessel company our games were on their ships on three different of their ships so not even all on the same ship <laughs> and they went bankrupt and they couldn't get any of their ships to port because it's I like two million dollars yeah so we were affected by that Jeez. um it was pretty horrible what, for what us. was the yeah. outcome for you um eventually we just got it and it nothing really changed from what was originally planned other than it took several months and so we had some loans that were due that we expected to be able to pay for with inventory that we didn't have for like four or five months after when we were supposed to have it wow um but it, it wasn't as bad as we thought because they they were in other countries just saying like we can't pay the two million dollars so we're just going to divide it amongst everyone who has cargo on our ship so they some people were paying like three times their shipping costs so, and we didn't have the money to do that. So I was like, I already spent X number of dollars on shipping this game here. I can't pay two more times that. I already took out loans to, to fund some of the other stuff. Um, and so, yeah, that was pretty bad. Um, yeah, it sounds like it. So we, we didn't make a, another game for a little while. I was working on Supernatural Socks, but I, I didn't have the gameplay exactly where I wanted it. And Supernatural um, Socks is about losing your socks in the laundry right yeah so, yeah so that one is another game I, one. I i designed i'll mention that in a second All so right. then we, we went so again you know we were working on that project and i was like i don't want to launch it yet i don't think it's right and uh the graphic designer uh owns a board game company in argentina so called okay additionas and so he um, had this game called Mutant Crops, and he was like, hey, you want to license this and put it in English? And so I was like, sure. And I had a board game retail store. I had one from the University of Florida. I won like free retail space for a year. Wow. And I, I left the game on the shelf, and I, I would just like had it. I was too busy. I didn't get a chance to play it. And then customers started playing it a lot. And everyone like seemed to really love it. And then <laughs> I was like, hey, can you teach me how to play this? I'm supposed to be <laughs> So, so customers taught me after reading through the rules and they're like, yeah, this is how you play. I was like, this game is pretty cool. And uh, so I decided to sign it. And so we launched that. Uh, and it's a game about mutated crops. So there's these mutant crops that you have to feed in water in order to get points. So it's a super light worker placement game. And we actually uh, got the dice power seal of approval recently for that. So I that actually cool. watched that video after you, I think you might've linked it or something, but that was interesting. Yeah. It looked like a fun little micro resource management game. I think. Yeah, it's, it's good. I like it. Um, and so I was really happy and excited that he wanted to sign that with us. And then, then we launched supernatural socks, which is my theme uh, of lost socks where ghosts are stealing everyone's socks. So the game, <laughs> is set collection with card movement so essentially how it works is everyone has a wash and a dryer and you're playing socks from your hand three face down for all players and then revealing them in turn order each sock has a different effect and they're moving from washer and dryer so there's dirty socks and you can play them on your own dryer or someone else's dryer and they move everything back and then dress socks are all business, so they never get washed. They just go straight to the dryer. Ah. Um, so, like, each sock does something slightly different that thematically, like, works with why it would be that way. And then the second phase of the game, you have these ghosts, and they can manipulate um, your own washer or dryer, someone else's, or the pile of lost socks, which is just this, a pile in the middle of where the lost socks go. <laughs> uh. I have Sorry, a quick aside. About, I don't know, probably seven six or seven years ago i got tired of losing my socks or in the dryer or whatever so yeah. I, I finally just got rid of all of my socks and bought like 20 pairs of the same sock so even when i did lose a sock in the dryer i would have you know 19 socks instead of 20 but i wouldn't have to find them as, you know and throw yeah. that one out so it's that's just your game kind of reminds me of that point in my life where i was finally like all right i'm done <laughs> i'm tired of these real life ghosts stealing my socks yeah <laughs> So, so uh, it, it was sort of my, my brother and I had joked about that being a thing when we were kids, uh, that ghosts were the ones stealing all of our socks, and I thought it was funny. And I was like, well, if I make a game about this, it, it can be clever and interesting, and it's not a theme that's really ever been used before, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, uh, I liked and, it. And, 
and I was like, the the thing is, I, I felt like it hadn't been used before, but it was really relatable. And that was the thing with cul-de-sac too, is like, I read like statistics that one in four people have had an annoying neighbor. Uh, and so I was like, well, enough people are going to relate to this where they're like, oh, I remember that neighbor. Or I am that neighbor. <laughs> I think and, that's such an underrated thing in game design is making a relatable theme. I'm making currently making a list of like 33 gateway board games and card games. Hmm. And a lot of them I've noticed that are great at teaching someone that doesn't know anything about the hobby is having a relatable theme like Ticket to Ride. It's like about the geography, about making a train go from point A to point B and whatnot. And you're, yep. you're, both of your games seem to be relatable by a lot of people, like you said. So I think that's yeah. a very underrated thing that you're doing well. And you said uh, the Supernatural Socks and the Cul-de-Sac Conquest, those are both your themes and the other one is your... Yeah, so I, I designed those. Um, I designed Supernatural Socks as like I was the only designer on it and I had some developers that worked on it afterwards. Um, Cold to Stack was sort of, I had business partners at the time and they, them and my brother helped me with game design ideas for that a lot more. And so you, I think you stuff. told me before, but you're a theme first designer and then you put mechanics on the theme or is that, uh, you have themes so, and you try to, I don't know, how, explain. So mo <laughs> most of the time I would say, so like, Supernatural Socks was 100%. I was like, okay, uh, this this mechanism I'm going to design around this game I thought seemed interesting. But I, I started with a theme and I was like, how can I design mechanisms around this that would like really fit the theme but would be interesting as something new? And I like set collection games, but most of them are just like, oh, you collect a set here. And I thought it would be really interesting that there's more movement and sets only worked in certain ways so all the cards can manipulate sets so there's and a lot of the like the take that style cards in the game actually can be used to your benefit if you use it right huh. so like i i had there's one instance of a card that um like the dirty sock you can play it on yourself or on someone else um and it can be beneficial if you play it on yourself sort of thing that's awesome I'll probably be done in a few minutes. All right. All right. So I have a question from social media. Daniel asks, how to start it up? How to start? Where do you start for making your theme? You said you're a writer. So do you get a lot of inspiration for that? or? Yeah. So uh, most of my games kind of stem from writing. Um, not not always. I, I write a lot about, like, I like to write, like, serial killer books and that sort of thing and so i obviously don't design too many games around that <laughs> um i i do actually want to design a serial killer board game i think that'd be cool but um but i i think most of it is like i think of it like a story and so I, i'll come up with the theme and i might not necessarily write the story for it first but i the story is in my head the whole time and then i i'll put it to the idea to mechanisms and whatnot and then once those mechanisms like come to fruition, then I think, okay, well, let's actually like physically write out that story. And some of it changes a little bit from what was originally in my head, but most of the time it's pretty much what I had been thinking of the whole time when designing it. Very cool. And there, so in the game design world for the audience, there's usually what you would say theme first designer, which is what Andrew does. He thinks of a cool theme and then tries to put mechan mechanism mechanics <laughs> on top of that. And then there's, mechanics first designers which think of oh i want to make a resource management deck building game or whatever and then they slap a theme on top of it which is mostly what i or what i have ended up doing i have i have a theme of my grandma's stories and so i call it Meemaw's monsters it's monsters based off her stories and i take different game designs that i have and usually just put that that theme on top of it because i'm wanting to make a game about that but just, just an aside for yeah. those listening. Um, it, I think I think it's interesting too, like how different designers have different processes. But I, like even like I said, most of the games that I've currently published are a lot of theme first. But I have a, a game idea now that I I was thinking when I was walking one day, and I think it would make an excellent game. I have no idea what the theme would really be. Uh -huh. I I sort of have it like it's. Uh, the board game industry and so there's like different worker types and they're different like personnel in the industry so like marketing people and so you're you're running a publishing company 
but Sounds fun. Uh, the mechanisms themselves were kind of what got me. I, I thought it would be really interesting to have like worker cards that you, you have to spend as sets in order to get the workers, but then anything you spend instead of being discarded is divided amongst other players. So you give them more opportunity to get better workers by spending things. That sounds fun. Like a uh, board game publisher tycoon. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see how it goes, but I, I'm actually trying to find another designer that wants to work on it with me because I just am super busy. So Yeah. Well, that's cool. Um, okay. Amber asks, what is, what are the what are popular themes and what is too cliche or in your opinion what's what's kind of overdone um, you know so there, there, there's typical ones that I think people think are overdone uh, there's eight million Cthulhu games um, probably just about as many with zombies and um, there, there there's a, a lot like that and there's some really popular themes that aren't I don't think super overdone. There's a lot of dinosaur games that came out recently. I think dinosaurs are pretty cool, so I'm I'm fine with that. <laughs> uh, I, I I don't think there's any of them that I I don't really like. I don't think there's any theme where I'm like eh, I don't need this because I have eight million games of this theme. Um, but I I feel like there is a little bit of me like I probably wouldn't buy a zombie Cthulhu game, um, but. That makes sense. What what are your what's your take on fantasy game fantasy type games? Like, there's a lot of subgenres in that, but that that's still pretty popular. It seems. I I feel like to a lot of people, fantasy games are great. Um, I think it is more of a turnoff for me, um, just because I, I it it's competing with. So the the main thing for me and a part of why I use the themes I do, is. I, I think they relate to people and it's really hard to compare it against something else. Uh -huh. So like with Supernatural Socks, when it was on Kickstarter, if you wanted a quirky game about lost socks, there wasn't anything else you could get. <laughs> like you have to buy this one game if that's what you're looking for. Or if you're even looking for anything in the quirky realm, it was probably the quirkiest game on Kickstarter at the time. Huh. So. It, even though there was a you know big massive AAA projects on Kickstarter, you know Cool Mini or not had one while we were alive, and it took campaign funding from a lot of the campaigns. But I felt like it wasn't as impactful to us because the demographic I was going after, I was showing like this game doesn't fit into any of those subsets. It's not the same as anything else. So if you want something like this, you can get that. that I think sense. when you do a, a fantasy or a zombie or anything like that. You're competing a lot of like there, people will su even subconsciously think about oh okay I remember this other zombie game and that art works a little bit better, um, and and I think it it's a lot more noticeable too when your artwork is kind of, eh, when it's a, a theme that's really been played out because they because they they think of all these other games with that theme and they're like well that one has better artwork or the mechanisms are slightly better and so once you start getting into that. Uh, level of being compared with everything else is really hard as a small publisher to compete against that's bigger really companies with more money and artwork budget. I never really thought of it like that. That's actually really smart <laughs> for solo game designers like what I am and most of my audience. Um, Zach asks, sorry, I'm trying to hurry through a couple of these. This is the last two. Uh, Zach asks two questions. He asks, how fleshed out should my theme be before sending it to a publisher? Or putting it on Kickstarter. Well, I guess that's two separate things. So we'll break that down. How, uh, how, as a publisher, how much of a do you want the designer to have the theme attached to the game? I, I think that's going to vary a lot, uh, like a super lot based on publishers. A lot of publishers will change the theme. There's been games I've looked at that I was like, I don't like this theme at all. I think the mechanisms are awesome. Now I the tagline for my company is a story for every game and a game for every story and so i definitely care about theme probably a lot more than other publishers but a lot will just be like well this theme's not going to sell and they just paste on a new theme now when i do that kind of stuff and i i have some games where i'm like eh, it kind of fits this theme but not really i try to get the mechanisms to fit a little bit more so it feels more like what you're doing in the game um whereas there's some games like I, I played Azul last night, and the game is great, but it just seemed like the theme didn't really matter. It, you're putting tiles on the board, but 
do I feel like I'm building a wall? Not really. Uh, uh -huh. If it did, it, you don't really actually finish at the end of the game. So it's not like I actually built a wall. I <laughs> kind of half assembled something, and then I'm going to have a contractor finish it for me, I guess. Huh. Um, That's interesting. But, but, so I, I, I felt like th there's games like that where the theme kind of just seems like it's there, and it's pretty, and you know, it, obviously that game sold incredibly well and has won all kinds of awards and is a great game. But so some publishers won't care and then others will. And then when you're self-publishing, depending on what your goals are, you know, it, it, the theme might not matter until the end. And you really don't want to get artwork until you're very, very far through the process and all the mechanisms and theme have been fleshed out entirely anyway. So if you're so set on kickstarting your own solo game, uh, if you're definitely set on that, how much Oh, well, you should probably have your theme done because you're going to have some art done. But how much of the art do you normally see designers have done uh, for Kickstarter? For Kickstarter, uh, I always, so I didn't have all the art for Cul-de-Sac, and it created massive delays that because artists take their time sometimes. And when how you're dealing with you it, um, there is a lot of unique illustrations. It, I mean, honestly, did you have like 20% of it done or like? Uh, probably like 30 some maybe like 30 percent but i also had the not safe for work expansion i did i had like one piece of art for like and there's like 54 cards in there all pretty much most of them were pretty unique I see. Uh, so i i had i probably had like 150 or 200 unique illustrations and only had like 30 percent done on kickstarter and i think that worked a lot better back in the day when i did that campaign like two and a half years ago that made sense but now i, I feel like there's so much competition. You need to send reviewers a final game, basically. That's like, this is what it's going to look like. And t in order to do that, you need all the artwork. So I would almost never encourage a publisher to go to Kickstarter before literally like everything is done. The game needs to be completely tested. But Supernatural Socks, I had very minor development stuff I was working on, but I already had three developers work on it prior to that. So and the I was finishing up the rule book, which sometimes is okay i i knew that there was going to be minor development tweaks so i didn't want to like pay to have a new rule book made and then do another rule book again for the final version so i i didn't have the like super final rule book on the kickstarter and I, even that i felt like was not great I, it was what i had to do because i wanted to launch the campaign at that time and get it out before um like october november time period for delivering to backers and so because of that you know i I rushed it a little bit of when I wanted to do the Kickstarter, but I feel like in the future, I, I definitely prefer to have everything done. And it's like, this is a finished game. If another company wanted to publish this and, or I had the money to print it, it could be printed and done right now. I just need Kickstarter to get the money for manufacturing. Makes sense. So maybe in before you could kind of pitch your idea more on Kickstarter, whereas now it's like, no, yeah, you this need is it. my game, all of it. Yeah. I just need money to mass produce it. So yeah, that makes and I, sense. And I almost would advise most first time creators to try to find a publisher for their first game and learn the process and see what publishers do before starting a publishing company. I wish I had done that. Um, there's, do you have some there's tips for reaching out to publishers? As a um, small game I, think, I think a lot of it is just going to conventions and finding ways to meet people. Once you know people, it's a lot easier to present the game to them. So doing it from like a selfless, uh, you just are talking to them or you buy their games and you just communicate with them at conventions and not always just pitching games. Sometimes maybe you're like, oh, can you look at this game? I know that it's not a game you would publish, but can you look at it and tell me like who you think would be good for it? Sometimes that's a good idea. Um, and then obviously smaller publishers are normally easier to get games signed by and also might be easier to work with if you want more creative freedom. So sometimes it makes sense to find a smaller publisher, have them do your first game, see the process and try to learn as much as you can. And then if you want to self-publish after that, go to it. But starting a business is a huge step. And I think there's a lot of people that try to do it and then they do a Kickstarter and it fails and then it's really discouraging and the game might be great and it just didn't fund because they don't have the marketing know-how or something like that. It's the business end of things. And if they found a publisher, that it, they might have done better essentially. Great insight. And his last question was, at what point, well, we kind of answered this one, but at what point in the design process do you make the theme? And for you, you, you typically make it at, at 
the first and build on top of that and some other people they do the mechanics and then build the theme so i guess it's designer yeah it, it it depends on the designer and and the game i mean i have literally like a, i think it's like 50 page document of different theme ideas i want to use and then i have mechanic ideas all kinds of mechanisms in my phone it's a separate document of like oh this is sounds like a really cool idea i have no idea what theme it would work with and then i kind of match stuff sometimes so sometimes they're the theme might have technically came first in my idea booklet or whatever. But when I find this mechanism, I'm like, oh, that works for that theme. And so I, I kind of design in all kinds of different spaces. Um, and so I'm not always theme first necessarily. And, That's cool. Um, what, what's one of your most excited, one of the themes that you're most excited about from that 50 page document? Um, so I, I wanted to make a carnival game for a while. Um, basically like, I, I, I feel like app games when I was younger or, or like, uh, like early video games on like PlayStation one or two, there was ones where you like pretty much played little side games and got tickets and stuff and you can buy things. And I love that stuff. I, I love that. I, yeah. I, I don't know exactly how to make it into a board game. I haven't figured out the mechanisms, which is why I've never like actually done it. But if I could find a way where it makes sense why you're you're gaining these tickets and buying the junk items makes sense and maybe they're worth like certain points for getting these like teddy bears and useless That's stuff awesome. at the carnival. I think that would be cool. Um, so I, I might do that eventually. I, I set up I set up my own carnival. I had a bunch of like little basketball games and stuff. I set up my own carnival. I went to Walmart, bought a, a roll of tickets and I had my friends over and we we did the whole thing. I didn't have like stuffed animal prizes or anything, but it's like see who can uh, get the most points with their tickets or whatever. But it was really fun. So I think that would be cool. Um, I know you're like in it, probably needing to get back to work. So uh, thank you. Andrew took his lunch break to talk to me, and I'm very appreciative of that. So <laughs> thanks for teaching us about theme. Hopefully we can do this again sometime because I still want to ask you about the University of Florida program, but I know that is probably not a short conversation. <laughs> no, it's uh... – the, the short version, I attended the University of Florida. That's where I kind of came up with the business. My business partners were from there. I entered a bunch of business plan competitions, and uh, I got into the Gator Hatchery, which is an on-campus incubator, and was able to utilize those resources to help start the company and then ended up getting third in the U.S. business plan competition the next year. Um, and, and then now I'm, I graduated in December, so I actually have to pay my loans back. Um, <laughs> Um, but so yeah so that's the very very thanks for the quick overview of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah i look forward to hearing more about that if you ever want to come back and to talk <laughs> yeah I, I always am glad to to help and talk to people and so if any viewers have any questions i'm glad to answer anything afterwards my twitter is atheris andrew and my email is andrew at atherisgames.com i answer emails semi-regularly I, I try my best but my email box gets kind of cluttered sometimes but I'll, i try to get to everything so. you said andrew at atherisgames.com yep cool i'm gonna put a, your links in the video but if i miss something just let me know <laughs> all, right. all right well thanks for coming on aaron uh, aaron <laughs> andrew sorry thanks for coming cool. on andrew and i look forward to talk to you more likewise <laughs> thanks for having me